Jen, welcome. We are really excited to be speaking with you. Thank you for having me today. Woohoo! Of, of course. That's a quite a lot of accomplishments there and in different areas of your life. If you meet someone new, how do you introduce yourself or how do you answer the question, what do you do? Oh, what don't I do, right? <laughs> right. That's like a normal answer for any mom. We do all the things for all the things in life. Um, yeah, I do my best to keep a balanced life of work, business, and you know, kids and personal, personal pursuits. Okay. Speaking of personal pursuits, most of us don't have world record holder in our bios. How did that happen? Yes. So I have. Um, I was in a car crash in 2018. That should have taken my life and thankfully didn't. Um, instead, it kind of woke me up to the fact that we do not get to choose when we die, but we sure get to choose how I live. And I was putting my life on hold. I was waiting until the kids got a certain age or they were in college or all these different things. And I'd get back to me. That changed everything. So 2019 became the year of the bucket list, I'd say. And I started dreaming of all the things I wanted to see, do, experience, you know, like try pasta in Italy, like that kind of stuff. In 2020, I was turning 40. And so I looked over my list of things I wanted to do and climb a mountain stood out. So I asked some friends that were into mountaineering, if you could climb one mountain in the whole world, what would it be? And they came up with a mountain named Ama de Blom. If you've seen a Paramount Pictures movie, you've seen Ama de Blom because it's the logo in the stars, right? I'm like, oh, perfect. That's a great uh, mountain. And it means the mother's necklace. I have seven kids, felt good. Well, COVID happened, right? So now I'm a homeschool teacher to seven children because all the schools shut down and nobody was traveling anywhere. And one of my boys was struggling with his homework. So I was trying to give him that parent pep talk. And I said, listen, buddy, we do hard things. And he looks at me and he goes, if we do hard things, why are you climbing a mountain called I'm a dumb blonde instead of a real mountain like Mount Everest? He said, I'm a... <laughs> It's a blom, honey, not I'm a dumb blonde, but thank you, sweetheart. Finish your homework. We'll look at Everest. So he did and we did and he went to bed and I thought, you know, why not Everest? If he thinks this is the hardest mountain in the whole world. I'm going to climb it and show him that whatever our Everest is in life, we can, we can hit the summit. So I hired a coach to train for Everest and the coach sent me a book about becoming an uphill athlete. And in the front of the book, there's a lady who got a Guinness world record for doing something in the Alps. And I was feeling kind of deflated as a parent and a homeschool teacher and all these things. And so when I was talking to my coach, I was kind of half joking. I'm like, if I would have done that, I would be a cool mom because I'd have a Guinness world record. And my kids learned how to read on those books. So boo, he goes, don't worry. I'll think of something even better. I'm like, okay, fine. But I'm not growing pumpkins or speed eating hot dogs, you know, all that stuff. So he, uh, he actually called me a few weeks later and he's like, Hey, I have the perfect record for you. I think you should be the first female to climb the seven second summits. And like everybody listening right now, I had no clue what those were. It sounded like a tongue twister. I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, listen, he goes, it's the second highest point on each of the seven continents. It's only been done by one male. So you'd be the first female to do it. It's harder than the first seven. And he goes, seven continents, seven mountains, seven children. It sounds like a jackpot. I'm like, it does. So I said, yes. And here we are. That's It's an amazing story, or at least a start of a story, because I have plenty of follow-ups there. So you're sold right away when you hear this plan, that this is what I'm going to do, the seven second summits. What you know, do you do? Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Was I, You finish. Sorry. I was going to say, what does the next day look like? Is this, I need to make my travel plans. I need to get in gear to be someone who can climb these mountains. Is it, I need someone to tell me I'm not crazy. What do you do next? Yeah, all those things. Um, Well, first of all, he comes up with the idea. I'm like, it does sound like a jackpot, but let me look at it. So I look up where all the mountains are. And you have to remember, like, I almost died like a year and a half before this all happened. And um, when I was going through my list of reliving life, I was like, I want to explore the world. Like, I want to see this planet and all these things before I die. And so it was taking me to all seven continents. It was unique places. It was with a pursuit. Like, so it kind of gave you a mission. I used to do triathlon and I love doing like racecations, right? It just felt fun. And so it, it felt right. 
even though I had not slept in a tent before, even though I had no clue what was going to be called of me or what it was, I was like, whatever, it hasn't been done by a woman. I'm going to do it. And if I don't do it, it hasn't been done by a woman anyway. So what does it matter? Like, let's just try it. So it was very much that. And, you know, I was did, said yes to this in COVID. So I climbed Ama de Blom first because that was like the thing I was going to do for my 40th birthday. And Nepal actually opened in October of 2020. It was an amazing experience. Still my favorite mountain to this day to climb. And then Chile opened next. So I'm like, let's try this. So I went down to South America and climbed the second highest peak there, which is Ojos del Salado. It wasn't my favorite climb, but I was like, okay, we got one under my belt. And then Kenya opened and then Everest. And so goes the story. Chris, those of us who've never climbed a mountain, if there's one story or one thing you want me to know what it's like to be on the side of a mountain going up, what would that be? Oh, climbing a mountain is so amazing. You, you're out in nature, right? You're at the top of this mountain. You take a deep breath in. It's almost like everything disappears. The sky, distance, time, colors, smell. Like you just become the feeling of awe. Then you start taking exhales and you inhale, exhale, and like life starts to come back together. And it just connects you to like how crazy big this world is and how insignificant you are, yet how cool that is, right? It's like this dichotomy of two extremes. And then you take your soul out of your body and it's like you throw it out into the world again and say, can't wait to find you next. Can't wait to see what journey I go on where I just get to connect to something extraordinary. I like that answer a lot. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, yes. I'm not sure it will get me on the side of a mountain just yet, but I, I, I oh, find it quite on. inspiring. Um, speaking of, I'm going to try to switch gears here. You mentioned speaking with your son and the phrase, we do hard things. Yeah. As a fellow parent, I love that. Where does that come from? And what what what's a kid's response when they hear that for the first time? Or how do you teach them that in practice? Yeah. Um, you know, I think life happens on our edges right? And we keep expanding those edges as we do things that are hard. And then our world becomes bigger. And so learning to lean into that discomfort and learning and to lead into that hard. And when you're a baby, walking's hard. When you're an adult, running a marathon might be hard. Like, I don't know what your heart is. We all have our own definition. But as we expand our capacity, our harder gets harder and harder. And we get to experience more of this world. I, I like that. I was recently someone had mentioned to me, it's like, you know, you don't ask for an easier path. You ask for, a, you build a stronger boat because it's never going to get easier. It's always going to get harder. So if you, it's just kind of that perception that, you know, you can try to make things easier, more comfortable, but you're not going to get anywhere. And, and you kind of reference that, that putting life on hold is where a lot of people find themselves. And you had a life altering, life changing event, but not everyone has that blessing in disguise. Is there a way to kind of break out of that <clears throat> kind of pattern where it's like, ah, I'll do this once this happens. Is there a way that every, someone who's not in an accident could say, yes, I'm going to do this tomorrow or I'm today I'm going to take this step. Yeah. You know, I think we need to spend time inventorying our lives, right? And where are we spending time? How are we feeling? Are we doing things that are exciting um, and all that kind of stuff. So checking in with yourself is the first step. And I do that regularly now because I know that I don't want another near-death experience to wake me up again to the preciousness of this world that we're in. But, and then just, it gets, it's hard at first, right? Like as a mom, I didn't even know what my favorite color was or what my favorite food was. It was just whatever was left over on the kids' plates. <laughs> I was just going through the motions. And then that accident, I was like, I couldn't even tell you if somebody wanted me to go out to dinner where I'd want to go. Like I'm changing that, like that's something I can change. And so we started going out to different restaurants, different weeks. And I'm like, oh, I like this place or I don't like this place. And so it's just really the teeniest, tiniest thing that you do for yourself. And then you just keep adding to that and you start becoming particular because that brings out the uniqueness that you are. 
I like that. That is the that is something I can change. That sm starting small and the example you give with the restaurants, like I want to be better at this. I want this to be different, and you make one small change and build on it. I like that a lot. There, um, you've mentioned parent being a parent of seven children. Uh, I would assume traveling with children is difficult at in any way, as, as I, I can attest to. But seven's a lot. And oh, by the way, I'm breaking world records as I'm doing that. Uh, who's planning all of this, and how are you balancing everything? Yes, 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 yes. So it's a lot of balance, right? And it's a lot of unbalance. So for example, when I decided that I was going to do this, I would work with my coach. I'd be like, listen, here's my work schedule. Here's my family schedule, fit in my training. And he'd be like, ha, ha, ha. Like, where are you? Like, you're not climbing anything, but something in your backyard. If this is how many hours I have, I'm like, I'm sorry, this is reality. So then we had to start getting creative. So, in, you know, friends of mine that I met at Everest, some of them would have 10 hours a day to go hiking, right? I didn't have that back to back. So I would get up in the morning, maybe before the kids would get up and I would do the treadmill at an angle. Then I'd get the kids to school. And if I get lucky, I'd get out on the mountains. I live in Park City, so I'm right by the mountains, which helps a ton. And then when that evening came and if a son had a soccer game, I'd be the mom at a soccer game with a 12 inch step. I'd bring that 12 inch step. I put a backpack on full of water bottles and I would be doing an hour and a half on that step up. Good for you. It was something, right? I mean, something's better than nothing. And it's these little teeny tiny things that you add together that allow you to accumulate fitness to be able to do these big things. I mean, that that right there is an example of not making excuses. You know, I have to be at this place. I can't do this. It's, well, I'm going to make the best out of the situation and I'm I'm going to kind of push it forward. That's That's great. Um, what is it like when you get home? How do you tell people you're a word record holder? Is there an event? Are there people like waiting when you get off the plane? What is that like? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I shared the entire journey, right? Since the beginning, which I did not want to do. I wanted to wait till the end and then tell everybody kind of have it be like my secret cocktail party surprise. Um, but I have friends. And when I started this, it was during COVID. They're like, the closest we're going to get to these environments or these experiences is by you sharing. So you need to share this entire journey, the failures, the highs, the lows, all the in-betweens so that we can kind of feel like we're a part of it. I'm like, okay, that's fair. So I did. When I came home after Mount Logan, um, I just wanted my family at the airport because it was really my family and I that did this pursuit together. Now, did I, I've had parties along the way for sure. And I have a book coming out. So we decided that we're going to combine this last Hey, we got the record with the book launch so that it was just all things combined in one. So we're going to have that January 7 in Park City. Very nice. And what can you tell us about the book that's coming up? So the book is super exciting. I swear to God, it was harder to do than <laughs> climb the mountain, I to be honest. I named it Break Proof, Seven Strategies to Build Resilience and Achieve Your Life Goals. And it came to me because halfway through the pursuit, I went out to lunch with a friend and he was like, you need to write a book. These stories are fascinating. And I don't even like mountaineering. And he goes, so if you write these books, and when we were talking, he's like, so many of the things that you need to do to get to the top of the mountain is the same thing somebody needs to do to achieve their goal or to build their business or to whatever. So he's like, you can tie all these principles in together and really benefit people. So I take the reader to the mountain, bring them into some crazy experience that I've had because there's a lot of crazy and then extract a lesson and give them some Q&A so that they can figure out, oh, wow, maybe this is something I'm struggling with to get to my top. And if I change these things or do some things differently, I can go further on my pursuit. So it's been really well received so far, and I'm really excited about it. Very nice. Very nice. And how you part of your background, successful business owner, working with clients, working with people who can uh, take these mountaineering lessons into the business world. How were you able to to translate them? Does one come more naturally for you or how did that look or how did that work? Um, you know, I think the mountains made it more clear because I was in life or death situation. So all of a sudden things got black and white really fast, where in business where it's not your life on the line, we can be a little more loose on some of our decisions which can be good or bad, right? So one of the big lessons that I learned from climbing Everest, for example, is big mountains take big teams. If you're trying to have, say you have an Everest-like goal, metaphorically, 
and you're trying to do this alone, you're not going to get to the top, right? Your bag's going to be too heavy. It's going to be too long of a journey. There's going to be too many storms coming your way to start at the bottom and get to the top. So if you have a big goal, you want to be a big company, you're going to need a big team to make that happen. And the sooner that you recruit those people to help you, the lighter the load you have, the farther everybody gets to go together. That's good advice. And I want to hone on the recruit good people part, because that can sometimes be difficult, both in business, personal life, to surround ourselves with the people who can kind of push us forward or to keep the metaphor going to help us get to the top of the mountain. What have you found is a, a key to attract talent, um, get them on your team and to ultimately you know work together? Yeah. You know, I really think that everybody has to have a deep compassion for the summit because the summit has to pull you forward. If you're not committed to that goal together, then when it gets hard or sideways or the wind blows at you, those people are gonna leave. You also need to think about what your strengths are and hire to your weaknesses, right? So I am a type A person. I have a lot of people that help in my house. We cannot have too many cooks in the kitchen. Right. So I know that some of the people that are helping me might not be the best people to run the home, but they're the best people to get certain tasks done because that's their strength. So when you know what your strength is, you want to play to that, right? Like we like to be in our zone of genius. So who do I need to hire around me that allows me to stay in my zone and lets them operate in theirs? And I think that's good advice, to especially the, the zone of genius part, identifying where you can be aided or where others' talents can fit well with yours. But sometimes I found not, not knowing what our zone of genius is or what even our weaknesses are. You know, Sometimes I think I'm good at everything or I'm not even sure what I'm good at. How can we take that step back and figure that part out? Yeah, you know, I think it's getting really honest with yourself and seeing like doing some inventory. So if you sit and look at your week um, for work, for example, uh, and you realize, oh, I don't feel really good after that meeting, or I don't really feel, I feel exhausted after I got on stage, or I felt exhausted after I had to take notes all day or sit and research things or do things like that. Like just being honest, like, oh, I did I feel energized or did I feel tired at the end of this activity? If you felt tired at the end of the activity. That's an activity that you don't really enjoy. If you felt energized, you're like, give me more, give me more. You lost track of time. That's something you really like to do. So the idea is to build your, a calendar that gives you more of that because that's going to be easy for you to do. You're in the flow. So I think it's really just being honest. The easiest way to start being honest is taking inventory of how you're feeling and just really getting precise. That sounds really simple, but that's pretty profound because I, I think that that's spot on, that there are things that we do because we feel we have to do them and they're just draining. And there are other things that we that we actually enjoy doing. We don't find ways to do more of it. And it is possible if you just take that simple inventory. So that's really great advice coupled with you know, now I know who to surround myself with to plug in those areas that are maybe weaknesses. So that's wonderful. Thank you there. Um, the term breakproof. how did you decide to call that your book? What was the, what was the story behind that? Yeah. Um, that's a battle, right? Coming up with a title to a book for sure. For me, when we are on a pursuit, we're almost always going to break at some point, right? Like even in a relationship with your significant other, there's going to be breaks along the way. When those breaks happen, you have proof in the break of what's working, what's not working, what you need to do to continue on and make things come together. And so instead of seeing a break as, oh my goodness, I need to quit. This is the end of the world. I want you to have that break, sit in it and figure out the proof of what's working, what isn't and start to collect that data to figure out what the best move is for you to take the next step forward. I like it. That's It's a good title for a book, and I, I like the subhead as well. Uh, kind of with the break proof and with mountaineering in general, what would you say is the most difficult part of, of being on the side of a mountain or having multiple mountains in your in your plan? That it's what I'm doing right now is really difficult, but if I get up and then get back down, I still have four to go. What What is the most kind of difficult part, kind of taking yourself through that process? Yeah. Um, there's so many difficult things that come our way, right? And here's the deal. Whether we're climbing a physical mountain or a metaphorical mountain, it's never the things we plan for that are going to take us out. But the cushion that we built 
for those things that might happen is going to be the cushion that saves us for the things that we didn't anticipate, but show up. And now we have the resources to be able to handle them or manage them or continue on our climb. And so I think really just like, I don't know. I mean, it's almost like, I know this is going to sound crazy, but when you play Pac-Man, right? And it's almost like playing Pac-Man where we're climbing these things, we're going to just eat those little pebbles in front of us. And we just got to keep eating the pebbles in front of us and hope that we can get the board cleared before the little ghosts get us. And if the ghosts get us, like just keep playing until you get better at it and you get through that piece. Okay. Makes sense. Uh, we've, including Pac-Man, you've given us some really good visuals, some wonderful advice, and lots of things that I've written down in my notes as far as things I want to think of when we think back in this conversation or, or takeaways. If there was a billboard that you want that you post on the side of a mountain or anywhere that said, this is the one thing that I want people to learn from my journey that 99% of the people, actually probably close to 100% of people won't be on, but I went on this journey and I want you to take this away. What would that be? Yeah, you know, I'd say one of the best things that's helped me in my pursuit is this thing called trigger meditations. Okay, so you pick a trigger, whether it's a red light or a doorknob or every single time you tie, tie your shoes or brush your teeth or do whatever, something that you do frequently during the day. And when that thing happens, it causes you to stop and just take a few deep breaths and get out of the story and back into your body. So for example, I like to do my trigger meditation as like touching the doorknob. So any time I touch a doorknob, like shut it to go to the bathroom or shut it to leave the house or open the door to get into the house, like that triggers me to slow down and say like, am I happy? Am I doing this the best way? Am I doing something that brings me joy? Is there something that I'm thinking about right now that isn't helping me? Can I let that go for five minutes and just think of something I'm grateful for? And having these little micro resets throughout your day really adds up to a different experience by the end of the day. And so I think so much of the time we just get caught in the motion, we start going through things. We don't even realize we're on autopilot. And if we can break that autopilot and live with more intention, we're going to have so much more joy in our pursuit. That's great. I like that. I'm going to steal that for sure. So thank, thank you for that. Uh, we've talked a lot about doing hard things, the things you've accomplished, uh, both in business and life. What do you do? I, I, I'm assuming meditation is one. What do you do to unwind, to relax, or to take time for yourself and kind of just get away from difficult stuff? You know, like the beauty is like my pursuit athletically is spending time in nature and getting outside away from the noise of the world. So it was a moving meditation at some level of just unplugging and being in a spot where my cell phone service doesn't work. And the, guess what? When I come back, the world's still running. Everybody got picked up from practice. No one's dead. Like everything seems to work out. And the more you have those experiences of going offline and having things working out, the more comfortable you feel offline. And I feel like the more balance you have in your life. Very nice. Well, uh, I have fired plenty of questions at you. I'm sure I could do that for much longer, but what's something I didn't ask you that I probably should have as we're wrapping up here? Ooh, that's a heavy question. Um, I would say one of the other lessons that I've learned from climbing is the first thing I do now when something gets overwhelming or scary or hard or just like exhausting as I ask my question, who can help me? Who can help me make this easier? Who can see something from a different perspective? Who can add value here that I'm not thinking of right now? And that just gets me out of me and allows me to group think whatever I'm dealing with and allows other people to be a part of my story. I think so much of the time we feel like we have to go at this alone. And that's us telling us that. That's not anytime I get asked for help, I love helping. It's taken me a long time to learn how to ask for it. But since I've learned how to turn that into my superpower, my life has been infinitely better. I'm not going to land this, but I think that ties together everything that we talked about very, very, very well. The, the, the who can help me? I've heard that from a lot of successful people, people that know what they're doing, and it goes hand in hand with, I love helping others. And then they, they really kind of fit well together that everything you talked about, there's always people with you, coaching you, helping you, working with you. And that those two things really are 
who can who can help you get to where you want to go and how can you help others in their pursuits um so i hope that comes through it certainly has in our talk and i hope that's what our listeners get from from listening to this and i'm sure from reading your book and from listening to your podcast as well i kind of with that where can our listeners find you or connect with you if they want to to learn more jen yeah please so check out my website jendrummond.com that will have a link to purchase the book, some challenges that I run and all my social media channels. So pick your platform of choice, reach out, say hi, connect. I love it when I hear from you. So thank you for the opportunity to share my story today. So we will post all that for sure. Jen, this has been a blast. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I wish you the best of the book and uh, just continued success with everything that you do going forward. Thank you.